All right. So in talking about the expansion of space, then like it makes me, that makes me lead to, or, or think about other questions in terms of like, you know, the, the reality of life and, and kind of where it goes from here in terms of, you know, where, where we, where we go, like almost like from a virtual, virtual reality standpoint, I mean, we're kind of already starting to experience that, you know, do you see an element of that in, in terms of space that exists? I see that <clears throat> there's a common question um, amongst scientists, but I think it's been popularized uh, by I, I, because I have a, a lot of you know my regular friends who ask me about um, life in the universe and 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 the reality of of what this is that we're experiencing. And there's an there's an actual equation, the the Drake equation, or actually there's a, a paradox. There's a Fermi paradox that says, like we were talking about. Um, if life, if the universe is so teeming with life, why is it that we have yet to contact or make contact with with any life forms, or at least intelligent life forms? Because I mean, I, I, I'll tell you, I think there's like blades of grass and cricket type life forms that are vastly outnumber any kind of intelligent life. <clears throat> That's just, I mean, I think th those things only need photosynthesis to survive. They don't need complex, you know, carbon type meals. Um, if if I may interrupt, one of the things that, that seems kind of singularly dimensional in terms of the human or the the Earth experience to those that is there, like that's that's such a microscopic element of of what intelligent life, quote unquote, may or may not be. Like there's an element of what if certain conditions exist that are so far beyond what we even have the ability to comprehend that makes things relatively intelligent or have the ability to to function or exist. Uh, as living beings that that are so foreign you know to to what we can even imagine like i mean to me that that's where like this ball starts to roll downhill to where it's like a fucking avalanche of holy shit like it's hard to even begin to process it yeah i think <clears throat> i think one of the um, one of the answers to that why haven't we contacted it, it directly is a direct response to what you're asking i think we can witness it nowadays where where, or actually, the one of the responses goes the logical conclusion to intelligent life forms is inevitable isolation. We will inevitably isolate ourselves, and the reason why this this solution to this question of why we haven't contacted other life is scary is because we are witness to it every day. We can witness this brain in the vat experiment if we think about uh, if you if we were capable of building a virtual reality that then encompasses the whole world where where all feelings all emotions are only on the good side are you know a million times better more intense <clears throat> the the orgasms are just mind shattering and everything if we can tap into this virtual reality why then would anyone ever under any circumstance want to pull out of it well we i don't think we would you had me at orgasms yeah, and pulling out <laughs> that generally gets every that generally gets <laughs> everyone going yeah. but it's it's true if we could manufacture a virtual reality in which yeah. these conditions were were programmed in yeah. i mean we we would never want to yeah quote well, unquote like pull out yeah um but uh, so one of the one of the solutions to this problem is uh, of why we haven't contacted life is that that extend that kind of that kind of technology to other life forms and what's scary what i was saying what's scary about it is we're witnessing it every day more and more are people less and less looking up and towards the sky yeah. and more and towards our cellular devices to these yeah. virtual realities that we're creating yeah. where we're creating these and they're getting better and better at these video games these sims games all these games are are getting insane so we want to plug into these and these are those same things and and we make fun of those people, those kids that stay home and isolate themselves. Yeah. So there's, there's a, that's a prime <clears throat> example of what happens if a, a, an intelligent species creates a virtual reality that then doesn't want to pull out of it. Well, apply that to all other life forms out. Let's say we're late to the ball game. We were one of the more recent species to to come about. And the reason we're not hearing from anybody else is because they've reached a level of intelligence where they were able to manufacture a reality, virtual reality, in which they don't bother searching for anyone else or sending signals or anything like that. So you're saying the iPhone is actually hundreds of years old. <laughs> it could be. Something like <laughs> plugging into your iPhone, if you could yeah. unplug it, yeah. you know. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. And, and it just made, like, as you're explaining it or talking about it, it made me think of two things. Number one is that 
I think we have our answer in that, you know, it's, I don't even think it's really a question of would we prefer that or not. We already are. I mean, go to, go to a fucking park, go to dinner, you know, and you'll see families or, or couples where they're just on their phone and they're like, they're sitting three feet away from somebody. I mean, I, I know I'm guilty of it sometimes. Fucking everybody is. I mean, you can say you're not, but, but you are. I mean, anybody that has a smartphone yep. is, is guilty of it to some degree. You know, to where whatever it is that's inside that device or or where it's leading to virtually is is more important and more interesting than the motherfucker sitting right across from you. Um, you know, so as that gets better, I think it's going to get worse. The, to me, the kind of the philosophical question is, is, you know, you see the power of the meme of, you know, like... It, it, what I, I found it ironic. Like I was on, I, I stay off of Facebook a lot these days. I, I don't go on social media other than for business and, and brand wise or, or whatever when I need to. But in terms of just wasting time on it, I, I almost don't do it anymore for that reason. But there was a like a series of pictures that had you know these these depictions of like the phone encompassing a guy's face and, and all of these like dramatic drawings of of you know phones. Um, you know, integrating into our lives and taking over and, 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 and they're all very negative and everybody's like, Oh yeah, it's so true. Yeah. You know, it's too bad. We're doing that. It's like, motherfucker, you're on a phone posting. You're, you're looking at, yeah. at a phone while you're bitching oh, about yeah. it. But, but you know, that brings me to the broader question of, you know, if you think about it again and kind of more even keeled is like, who, who actually gives a fuck? You know, ultimately, like if that makes you happier, is that necessarily a bad thing? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, I don't know. But like to just assume that that's a negative, like, well, why is it a negative? Like, well, it's because you're focusing more on that. Well, if, if, you know, scrolling Facebook makes you happier than your spouse, maybe your spouse is fucked up, you know, <laughs> but but why is that? Like, you know, who, who's to argue that that's not necessarily a, a better environment? You know, I think it's it's easy to make the argument that it's not. But my point is, is, is to look at it at least a little bit more more fairly and saying, you know, people aren't killing each other, at least, you know, they're not out fucking dumping oil down a drain, like, or, or you know, polluting national parks or, or whatever, like with the amount of fucking people on the planet is that that matrix scenario where there's, you know, banks of fucking human pods plugged into a fucking system. Well, at least you're not out fucking things up. You know, I, I don't know what, what's your take on that. So I, I agree. I, I, I honestly can't stand the constant negative press, I guess you can say, on how terrible social media is, how terrible people are attached to their phone. That's just the way it is. These arguments, I think, have been had, you know, for like, at what point does this argument die? Like, you know, how terrible were cars back yeah, in the day and then yeah. railroads and then like the Morse code and and, <clears throat> and newspapers and I newspapers know. Yeah. And, and like, just yeah. let it be. However, I think in my personal experience, when I'm when I am addicted to social media, I find that it's not that I'm necessarily because I'm ignoring pe people walking across the street that I could potentially develop relationships with, but I'm too busy looking at my phone. I am generally on my phone interacting with the people who matter. It's my brother, people who I wouldn't otherwise be able to communicate with due to geographical disparity, yeah. you know, yeah. my brother, family members, people who I think instead of maybe developing this passerby kind of smile high instead I'm, I'm doing what matters I'm, I'm maintaining connection to those so I don't I don't really see at least for me I, I don't like that argument because I use it in a way that's like where the people that I care about are the ones that I'm talking to or yeah. I'm sending ridiculous memes to and we're, yeah. getting, we're getting laughs together and that's yeah. what matters you know yeah. you're, you're just doing that virtually what yeah. what people who are complaining about are fail to recognize may fail to recognize is that I'm still participating in that kind of you know, that kind of relationship and, yeah. and closeness attachment with people that I care about yeah. in these, like, this, it just happens to be the way we represent that kind of connection today yeah. in modern society. Yeah. So I don't, I don't see, I, like you, I don't, let's look at the positives behind yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, again, back to balance, here we go again. I should yep. get fucking But I agree. There's always this back. balance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, like, can you can you overdo it to the point where you know? I think like with kids too, there there's an argument to be made in that from a developing brain and, and the dopamine receptors of allowing them to social media, where where their self confidence and 
um, and mentalities are, are distorted because of the amounts of likes or lack thereof or things like that, I think can be, can be negative. I, I do view some elements of, of social media and internet usage across the board as almost like a drug or, or, uh, can be an addictive element to, to where it, it should be at least recognized as such and maybe regulated a little bit until you're old enough to, to do it yourself. Oh, agreed. Uh, but absolutely, but yeah, I'm right there with you, and that there's an element of of it that's that's demonized to a point uh, to to where it, it, I think it it's maybe a little counterproductive and gets frankly fucking irritating to to hear. But uh, <clears throat> at any rate, um, you know, one other thing, space wise, I guess that uh, that I I know I'm I'm curious about, and and, and other people are. One of the things I don't fully understand is is in terms of the effect of gravity on aging. And, and you were talking, you mentioned it earlier about once you go outside, and you'll have to, to reframe the, the statement that you said so I can maybe try to understand it better. But once you go outside certain objects, uh, that, that time slows down or it changes, whatever. Can you can you expound on that? I don't, I don't really grasp that. Yeah, there's just heavier or I should say more massive objects. If you If you think of the universe, if you have a, a blanket that you spread across, you know, a chair, a heavier object will distort. You take a marble, it's not going to distort it that much. And then you take a, a bowling ball and you put it on it, it distorts it a lot. Mm-hmm. So that because space and time is a fabric, it's going to, it's going to warp the rate at which you experience time around that object. So, mm-hmm. so as you are in orbit or close to this <clears throat> massive body your space time is warped it's spread that fabric is spread thereby spreading i guess you can say time um in itself and and it's going to go by slower whereas like less massive objects uh don't distort space time as much and they'll like earth will whip whip around the sun and you'll feel time regularly but if you're orbiting you know, the event horizon, let's say, of the outer rim of a black hole, which is super massive, you know, uh, almost infinite mass and density, your, your frame of reference, in physics, it's all about different frames of reference, your, your frame of reference, you're going to experience it in what you think is normal, you know, but the, because that space and time fabric is so warped, when you leave that frame of reference and return, everything's going to have been changed. Yeah. Things are going to have traveled, time is going to have traveled or I guess gone by faster on earth where there's a less mass as opposed to that, you know, that dense or, or massive black hole. And, and, and so that's one of the things with uh, like the movie Interstellar where that there's that one example of, can you, can you describe like the, the premise behind why, why that, for those of you that haven't seen it, it's a, it's a fucking brilliant movie, but um, where the basically they're, they're in that, that space capsule and then Matthew McConaughey and, and uh, a couple other people leave and, and they, they go through like a, a black hole basically. To they, what they do is they're, they're like, I don't really remember the specifics on the movie. I know that they're in like a space station and then they, Matthew McConaughey and whoever that external, that party is that leaves with him, they, they head to a planet that's orbiting or I guess that's in or nearby a black hole. And one of the golden nuggets of that movie, I don't know if, if you've picked it up, is while, if you have listened carefully and while they're walking around on that planet, you'll hear a hmm. There's a click that happens about one every 1. 1.3 seconds, and that's a whole Earth day that passes in that time frame. So if you pay attention oh, and shit. you listen to the background, that happens throughout the whole time that they're on that. Really? Yeah, and it's, hmm. it's really neat. It's 1.3 seconds or like 0. 0.3 seconds. You hear it faintly in the background. So yeah. it's super cool that they added it there just as a reference. That's fucking But wild. they just happen to be on a planet there that they're testing for for you know possibility of habitation. Um and and it just happens to be orbiting a black hole or or another massive object. And so that's why that disparity, I guess you can say, between the original space station and where they are is so warped that time goes by so much slower in reference to to where that guy, I think the old guy who, who ends up becoming old yeah. after 27 years or something yeah. because he's not feeling the effects of the massive, uh, black hole. Yeah. It's, it, which is super neat. That yeah. dilation is, is yeah. like I said, it's what got me as a kid. Speaking of dilation, can you tell me what a, what a black hole really is? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of, yeah. that's why we call it a black hole. Cause yeah. it's like, that is a trip. Like black holes are fucking, I mean, if you, if you can just again for the listener, all, all smart ass porn <laughs> references aside, 
uh, you know, I- explain the, the reality of a black hole as to the best of your knowledge. So like a black hole can form when there's a, a, a massive star, like our star, our sun will not become a, a black hole because it, or sorry, it will not become, it will not end up condensing into a black hole because it's not big enough. I know it's crazy to think our, our, our sun is actually 98% of our entire galaxy. So all the other planets are just pebbles kind of, um, but you need a planet. There, there are a couple of ways that a black hole forms, <clears throat> but when you have a star that's super massive, after something like that, you know, goes supernova and the core remains and then it begins to condense in itself. It's difficult to explain in three dimension because we, it occurs like it pushes outside the fabric or I guess it pushes away or down into, I guess you can say down into. Um, but when an object becomes so massive that the fabric containing it can no longer contain it, it's like you you have that marble on the blanket and then you have a a um, like a bowling ball also you put that next and it it, devi- it i guess it folds that blanket a little bit more now try to take something as big as the earth as massive as the earth and con- con- condense that down to the size of that of a, of a light bulb and put it place it on it it's going to warp it so bad that it's going to change you know the the structure of what we understand as yeah. as you know scientists on earth um, but what we don't know is what's at the end what that singularity is, where does that take us? Yeah. You know, that's, that's super intriguing part. Where, where does that go? Yeah. Well, and so d- does a black hole have the ability almost like a vacuum to, to, to pull things? It, it will gradually pull in. It can, there's a, in fact, that's how we, <clears throat> that's how we discovered recently the gravitational waves because it's merging black holes. When black holes merge together, they, they give off such a ripple they, I guess it's so forceful that they ripple the fabric of space time, which we were able to detect that deviation here on earth and con- yeah. confirm that, that, that space is actually a, you know, space time fabric. Um, does that impact anything here on earth? Uh, not, I mean, or at least not there's yet. the LIGO, the laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory that it, it, it moves it. We can't, we need lasers to detect that movement. Okay. It's, it's tiny. It's minuscule. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that uh, it, it can eat stars, it can eat planets. It, I mean, it, it can devour galaxies. It can devour anything that that falls beyond that event horizon. That what's called like a Schwarzschild radius. It's the radius that the furthest external radius of a black hole, for which if you pass, you will never be able to get out of. Yeah. You will, and then you'll, as a human, you'll spaghettify. It's like a rip current. You're, you're you'll start stretching. It'll might feel real good at first because you're yeah. stre- stretching your back, but your feet are closer to the black hole than your head is so your feet will start spaghettifying more and they'll break in half possibly and then yeah. the rest of your body will just continue spaghettifying so is that if you know whatever object it is a, a galaxy planet whatever is is if it gets pulled into a black hole that's what happens is it it, it would i think it would slowly uh, what would happen is it'll slowly start stealing the matter uh, of it the if there's an atmosphere it'll start slowing slowly pulling those lighter metals those lighter elements and then after a while it'll just start spinning into this accretion disk sort of thing around the event horizon, and then it'll eventually just, devour it. Just destroy it, basically, yeah. like emulsify it almost. Or would not be a good day. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. That's some fucking deep shit, man. Um, that's it's wild. I mean, it, obviously, you know, you could argue that all of it's theoretical, uh, but I think enough of it has been proven in terms of our experiences in outer space to know that there's a lot of uh, fact or truth or credence behind uh, a fair bit of it. And it's uh, remarkably fascinating. So um, anyway, we could sit here all day and talk about it, but I know uh, we got uh, bigger fish to fry and other shit to do. So uh, in, in wrapping it up, um, I just, uh, as always, I, I like to, to say thank you to, to our, our listeners without you guys, uh, we would not have a show and uh I am uh, continually humbled by all of your gracious support and, and continued uh, support at that. So thank you guys. Uh, keep up the good work. Love everybody. And uh, as always, this is Mike Drummond.